by their church. So my role today is to share a, a word around giving and around tithing. And I found it interesting as I pondered on that, that I came to realise that the heart of God is always good toward us and even in tithing and giving. He has a heart toward us that's good and he, he is seeking to bring his goodness out of us as we give um, and as we tithe. That's interesting, isn't it? Oh, I found it interesting anyway. You see, he didn't create tithing for his benefit. He doesn't need our money. He, remember, he has a cattle on a thousand hills. <clears throat> it's for our benefit. It's because he wants to work into our hearts and into our lives the heart of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good? Through giving and tithing, he's able to do that in us. You know... Sometimes when we read scriptures, if, if we take one verse of scripture and we take it in isolation, you know, we can get the wrong idea. And, and then sometimes, I'm going to read you a verse from Luke 6, um, 38, but sometimes when we get the wrong idea, then um, our motives aren't what God's looking for. So let me read to you a verse that we hear quite often with our um, giving and tithing messages. Luke 6.38 says, Give generously and generous gifts will be given back to you, shaken down to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure that it will run over the top. Your measurement of generosity becomes the measurement of your return. I forgot to tell you that I'm reading from the Passion Translation. Now that's the truth. That is the truth. But if we read that, uh, just, just two verses back and read it a little bit more in context, let me read it to you um, from verse 36. It says, Show mercy and compassion for others, just as your heavenly Father shows mercy, um, your heavenly Father overflows with mercy and compassion for all. Jesus said, Forsake the habit of criticising and judging others. And then you'll not be criticised and judged in return. Don't look at others and pronounce them guilty and you will not experience guilty accusations yourself. Forgive over and over and you will be forgiven over and over. Don't you love that? And then we go to verse 38. Give generously and generous gifts will be given back to you. Shaken down to make room for more. So you can see when we read the verse in context that Jesus is actually teaching um, a principle that applies right across our lives, not just in the area of giving. I think it's called reaping and sowing. I'm sure you all know the scripture that talks about that. But it doesn't just apply to giving money. It talks about, it's talking about forgiving giving forgiveness, extending forgiveness to others, extending mercy to others, extending um, compassion and understanding to others, as well as giving. So it's about our heart attitude of being able to be like Christ to other people. But it does apply to our giving as well. If we don't learn to be people with a generous heart, as Jesus' heart was generous and his Father's heart was generous toward us, inadvertently we suffer the consequences. When we withhold forgiveness and become bitter, we're not forgiven. When we withhold mercy and become, our hearts become hardened and we receive no mercy, and if we withhold understanding, then we can't expect to be understood as well. If we give with the wrong motive, we circumvent what God wants to do in our lives, like changing our heart to be or to have the heart of the Father or the heart of Christ. You see, giving of our finances overcomes or helps us to work out selfishness and greed out of our lives. It also um, helps us to overcome the fear of, of, of being afraid that 
we won't have the provision that we need in our lives. And so when we learn to give and to give generously, it's actually um, um, helps us to come to a place of victory to overcome and, and to eliminate those landing pads that the enemy might have in our lives. It's an effective strategy to victory. And you know, generous giving of our finances also creates a, an atmosphere of community amongst us. And recently we've seen that as a, com a community. We've become a community in generous giving. And isn't that all for our benefit? It's not for God's benefit, is it? It's for ours, that he might be at work transforming us into the likeness of Jesus. See, nothing that God requires of us um, is not, or, or everything that he does require of, of us is part of this journey to becoming like Christ, even the giving of our tithes and offerings. We have to remember that the heart of God is always toward us. So when he requires things of, our, of us, it's because he's wanting to work something of his goodness into our lives. And the thing that we need to remember always is that we can never outgive God. Thank you. Let me just pray a short prayer for us together as a congregation. Father God, I want to thank you for this congregation here at Freedom Church. I want to thank you for their uh, abundant generosity and the way they delight in blessing others. And Father, I pray that you will continue to work in our hearts and lives, that we might become more like Jesus, that we might be like him and be prepared to sacrifice the things that we might desire to see others blessed and for their, for that, so that you might work your goodness in their hearts and lives and in our hearts and lives. Amen. Hi, church. Great to see you today. I'm so glad to be here sharing with you. How's your week been? We've had fun getting to know a few people. There's been people volunteering next door in the Mercy Shop and just helping with that. So grateful and thankful for those who volunteered and who are going to volunteer. It's a huge job, but we're just excited about the next chapter. I know God's plans are always good. So let's all get involved. Let's pray into it. Let's believe that we're just going to go forward in serving our community and loving the people in our community in a really practical way. I just want to pray this morning before I share with you. So let's just pray together. Father, thank you for the honour and the privilege of sharing your word today. Lord, I just um, commit myself to you. I commit my words to you. Lord, I pray that you would use me today to speak into people's lives, Lord, to encourage people, to build people up, Lord God, to give people clarity on things and to inspire them, Lord, for the future that you have for them. Lord, we just love you and we love serving you. You are awesome, Jesus. Amen. So if I wanted to start off this morning or this evening, who knows what time it is, but I wanted to start off with a quiz. So if you're at home with someone, just get ready and let's see how you go in this quiz. I'm just going to quiz you about some things that go together. So you fill in the second part and let's see if you're all right. Hammer and, Bonnie and, Salt and, Shoes and, Knife and. Okay, they were pretty easy, weren't they? Did you get all those right? I won't give you the answer because I think you got them. But today I want to talk about two other things that go together well, and that's worship and work. They both go together really well as we fulfill God's call on our lives. Let's look together at Luke chapter 10, verses 32 or 38 to 42. I'll read it for you from the NIV. Now it happened, as they went, he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered Martha and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, 
and Marion has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. So that's an interesting story, isn't it, that we read and many of us are familiar with that. Who would you say is the central figure in that story? I want to say today that the central figure in every story is Jesus. You remember that old song that we used to sing? Jesus at the centre of it all. I won't sing it for you. But it goes like that then, from beginning to the end, nothing in the world will do. Everything revolves around you, Jesus. And that's the absolute fact, isn't it? That everything revolves around Jesus. He is the centre of our lives. He's the centre of this universe. The universe was created by him. He's in the middle of all of it. And I just want to read out Colossians 1, 15 to 17, which is an amazing couple of verses. It says that, talking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. You know, Jesus wants to be central, not only in the stories that we read in the word, but the story of our lives. He wants to be central in our lives, and he wants to be central in every aspect of our stories. He wants to be central in our family life. He wants to be central in our work, in our career. He wants to be central in our relationships with friends. In our marriages, Jesus wants to be right there in the middle of those marriages. He wants to be the centre of our finances and he certainly wants to be the centre of the dreams and the plans that we have. Sometimes we're not great at doing this. Um, you may not know it yet, but John and I have two dogs. Their names are Barney and Bella and we're terrible parents. Barney and Bella are definitely inside dogs. They're little dogs and they live inside. But Neither of them are allowed in every room of the house. There's some rooms of the house that are shut to these dogs and they can't go in them. They can go in certain places, but the certain places they can't go. And I want us to think about our lives today. You know, Jesus wants to come into every part of our lives and every aspect of our hearts. It says that he knocks at the door and we're to open the door to him. You know, I believe that he's knocking on the doors of our lives and knocking on the doors of our hearts and saying, we want to come in, I want to come in and to be with you. I've certainly learnt through this season of um, the virus and, and um, the restrictions that we have and not being able to meet on Sunday, it's reminded me again and again that our God is not just a Sunday God. He's an every day of the week God. He's here wherever we go, whatever we face, and he wants to be in every circumstance with us. We don't have to do anything alone. Psalm 41 verse 10 says in the Passion Translation, Do not yield to fear, for I am always near. Never turn your gaze from me, for I am your faithful God. I will infuse you with my strength and help you in every situation. I will hold you firmly with my victorious right hand. What an incredible promise. Jesus at the centre of our lives. Jesus, the central figure of this story that we just read. The other two figures in the story are, are Martha and Mary. And I'm sure as soon as I read it, or as soon as I mentioned this account, that you began to think about one or the other and started to identify with one of these girls. I confess, I relate to Martha, and I feel a bit sorry for her when she was rebuked by Jesus. Look at this girl. She's a champion. She loves Jesus. She invited her to her home at a time when she could have been in trouble for doing that. She was thoughtful. You know, she invited him to have a meal. She didn't just say, Jesus, come on, we'd like to see you, but she invited him for a meal. She was hospitable a quality that's sometimes hard to find in our world these days when we love to text and phone people. 
She was hospitable. She invited him for a meal. Let's be people who are hospitable like Martha was. She was generous. She was hardworking and she was responsible. You know, she's a good girl, I reckon. It's good to serve. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Work is good. John 12, 26 says, If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honour. Colossians 23 um, chapter 3, verses 23 and 24 says, Whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of an inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. You know, working is good. Serving is good. Imagine if we didn't have workers in our church family. Imagine if we didn't have workers in our home. Imagine if on the team that you lead or the team that you're part of, you were the only one that served and worked. We would be in a really difficult place. Look at all that's happening next door with the Mercy Shop and what has happened for years. People who have worked hard and served tirelessly. You know, it wasn't that she was serving that caused her to be rebuked by Jesus. It was her attitude. When we serve, it's our attitude that we need to watch. The other character was Mary. And some of you identified with Mary, didn't you? You have discovered the secret of spending time in his presence. You love to sit at his feet. You love to search the scriptures. You love to worship. You love to pray. In the Gospels, we see Mary. This Mary is mentioned three times. And every time... She's at the feet of Jesus. In Luke 10, this one, she was listening to him preach or listening to the word. In John 11, it was just after her brother Lazarus had died and she had run to Jesus asking for his help. And in John 12, we see her washing Jesus' feet with her hair, worshipping him. You know, spending time with Jesus, spending time in his presence, I believe is the key to fulfilling his call on our life. How we do this doesn't always look the same. I love to get up early in the morning. I'm a morning person. And I love nothing better than to make a really nice cup of coffee and go to my armchair and sit down, put on some worship music and just spend some time with Jesus. I like to read, I like to pray, I like to think, and I just like to be in his presence. That's my special time. Some of you might have seen Dan doing the communion message a couple of days ago, and he was walking with the Lord out in a paddock with the kangaroos. You might be like that. Some of you might like to go and sit by the ocean. Maybe you like to pick up your guitar and sing. There's lots of different ways that we can really take that special time coming into Jesus' presence. We all need to find the way that sits with us. It's where we come to the source and we receive comfort, we receive peace, we receive wisdom, we receive strength, we receive refreshment, we receive spiritual nourishment. He speaks to our hearts. It's so important. Jesus' culture sings, In the glory of your presence, I find rest for my soul. In the depths of your love, I find peace that makes me whole. In the glory of your presence, I find rest for my soul. I love your presence. Mary loved the presence of Jesus and she loved just to sit in his presence and open her heart to him and receive from his heart. From there, we read on to the last verse in that chapter that says, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, that which is to her advantage, which will not be taken away for her. That was in the um, Amplified version. You know, I think sometimes when we read that Mary has chosen the good part, 
we think that the other way is the bad part. But I don't believe that that's what Jesus was saying, that there was a good and a bad here. I looked up some different translations and the Holman Christian Standard Bible said, one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it won't be taken from her. The, net, the New English translation said, but one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the best part. It will not be taken away from her. And God's Word translation said, there's only one thing you need. There's only one thing worth worrying about. Mary has made a right choice and that one thing will not be taken away from her. I think to worship is a good choice because it needs to be the basis from which all our service comes. Our doing must flow out of our being in relationship with Jesus. It is in his presence that we find the power that we need and the touch that we need and the heart that we need for serving in his kingdom and serving amongst our, um, in our world. This story is not about personalities. It's not about personal giftings. But it's about living the life that he has planned for us. It's about his church being effective. It's about fulfilling his call on your life. You know, we are called to be his heart. I think we're called to be his hands. We're called to be his feet. We're called to be his voice to our world. We're called to love and to serve. But the core thing in all this is our relationship with Jesus. And I want to challenge us today that we make that choice, that we choose to come to Jesus first, to allow everything we do in life to come out of our relationship with him. Let's find a way that we can come into his presence. Your way might be different from mine, that's okay. But find a way where you can come and you can sit at the feet of Jesus, where you can open your heart to him, where you can listen to that still small voice in your heart and receive what he's saying to you. Because that will be the perfect launching pad for the service that he's called you to. It may be a service in the church environment. It may be a service in your community. It may be service in your family. It may be service in your neighbourhood. But if we serve out of our relationship with Jesus, there will be such a touch of God on our service that people's lives will be impacted by us in a way that we could never impact them before. So let's do that, church. Let's just really take some time while we're still under a few restrictions. It's easy to find millions of things to do, isn't it? But let's step aside from the millions of things and let's find some quiet time and really sow into our relationship with him because he's just awesome. So Jesus at the centre of our lives. God bless you, church. Thank you for taking five to listen to me today. Let me just pray for you before we finish. Father, I thank you for this church family. I thank you for every person that's listening to this, um, this um, whatever it is, trans um, podcast, Lord. I just pray that you would bless each one, Lord, that your presence would not just be something that we talk about, but that your presence would be very real in our lives, Lord, that each one of us would know your peace, that each one of us would experience your hand on our lives and your touch in our hearts in a very personal way this week, Lord God. Father, bless your people. Make us strong that we might shine for you in this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Bless you guys. See you again soon. Bye. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance. My enemies not to them. <laughs> 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 oh.
Hi, Mom. No. <laughs> She's delivering the animals. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> to Jesus. It's sort of like, you know, Domino's delivery. <laughs> Right. 